Hello, my name is Stuart Kaufman, and we're going to talk about very large transitions in the evolution of how we think of the world. Neanderthal, our cousin species, emerged about 500,000 years ago. We emerged about 300,000 years ago, modern Homo sapiens. And we have looked at the starry sky, the plants and the animals around us as hunter-gatherers, and we've made sense of our world. We've made sense of our world for 300,000 years. Neanderthal did for 500,000 years. You might be interested to know that 60,000 years ago, Neanderthal had flutes buried their dead and used colored ornaments. They weren't that different than us. So for at least a half a million years, we and our cousins have been trying to make sense of the world, and it's our familiar questions. Who are we? Why are we here? What is this place that we are that we now call the universe? And we've had creation myths. It's terribly important that we are in the world that we believe we know. But the world we know keeps changing. And that really is the main subject of this set of discussions. The title of this is to come home again and recognize it anew. And the frame is we've been coming home and recognizing it anew for 500,000 or 300,000 years, and we shall again come home and recognize it anew. I want to start with what I will call our current creation myth. It's our best science, but I will call it a myth. The universe began about 13.8 billion years ago in the famous Big Bang and exploded outward and has been expanding ever since. Not too long after that, galaxies formed, stars in galaxies formed, planets around stars formed. To give us an estimate of the current number of galaxies and stars, there are 100 billion galaxies, that's 10 to the 11th. There's 100 billion stars in each galaxy. So that's 10 to the 11th times 10 to the 11th, which is 10 to the 22, or one with 22 zeros after it. And it's as estimated now that almost all stars have planets. So there's 100 billion times 100 billion solar systems with planets. Maybe there's life all over the universe. So our creation with now is a Big Bang, the formation of galaxies and stars and planets. The emergence of life, we have very good evidence that life emerged on Earth uh, about 3.7 billion years ago. Then we know about evolution and Darwin and the, the vast, mysterious, myriad evolution of life now with starfish and redwood trees and us and all, all the magic out the window that brought joy and wonder to our ancestors and still does to us. So here we are and that's our creation myth. We actually know something about what people thought 10,000 years ago. So I will be reading a poem concerning the folk tales called Kalevala. The Finns and the, their cousins, the Estonians, arrived in Finland and Estonia 10,000 and 11,000 years ago. The Ice Age was still around. Almost certainly the Baltic was frozen and locked in, in frozen water between Denmark and, uh, and Sweden. The, 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 the Balts uh, in, in Estonia have an ancient myth that shortly after they arrived, the water and the oceans dropped a few hundred feet very abruptly, as if the ice between Denmark and Sweden melted. For 10,000 years, the, the Finns in eastern Finland and Karelia passed down an oral legend, the Kalevala. In about 1840, a, a Finn wrote it down and froze the story in place. It's exquisite. I'm going to read you part of it, but I have to tell you how I heard it. I was uh, teaching in, in Finland as a Finnish distinguished professor and went to a talk in the town of Tampere, and a storyteller had come over from the from the lake country in England, he had a drum. And he told the story of Kalervo and Kulervo. I cried. 
and I wrote a poem afterwards, tried to capture the sense of Kalevala. My Finnish friends tell me I haven't ruined it too much, so I will read it to us now. It's my poem. Forgive me, I do not mean to show off. So I'm going to ask you to join me. This was about 15 years ago, the town of Tampere. I was there with my wife and some friends. And just picture this storyteller who'd come over from the Lake District, walking on the stage, beating slowly on the drum and telling the story. You need to know that Finnish has a five-part rhythm. So here it is. The first three stanzas are me. Then uh, we go into the Kalevala with the phrase, the lone woman. And the last two stanzas are me trying to frame it. I have to read it. Kalevala. I sing of Raya and Kaisa. I sing of two crones squatted knee to knee, hands locked, rocking, drum, thumb, 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 steady in the glittering, guttering flame. Kalevala, song of Finns, song sung since ice stacked land unshackled itself, and the lone woman, lone, wandered alone. Bird sprung from her breast, the lone tree whose fruit became the fruit, that became the meadow, became the hill, that filled the hill with bird and song, till Kalervo sired Kulervo, who, st who stalked the wild wood, rode the deep water, watered the land, cut the trees with the bare knife of Kalervo, and what left one tree left, its berries become all that is. I heard this song, more ancient, echoing down the days since first Finns roamed to this land, older than any telling, down the dark winter nights of this sun snow span, Raya and Kaisa, knee to knee, rock and sing to drum, thum, 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 thum. Well, I hope my stances haven't ruined it, but I am, I cried then and I cry now, again hearing this, the imagery is, is Neolithic or Paleolithic. The only signs of humanity are the woman, Kalervo and Kulervo, and Kalervo's knife. There's no gods. There's just nature and the woman from whom the meadows and the hills and the birds sprang. And I am just stunned by, and with the bare knife of Kalervo, left one tree left its berries become all that is that's a creation myth from 10,000 years ago why a berry well we know as soon as we say it the berry a berry gives forth life it's beautiful well so part of what i want to try to convey is that 10,000 years ago we were embedded in nature and embedded with one another in our families and in our lives. And the story of Calervo and Culervo carries with it awe and wonder. And it was told around fires for 10,000 years. Let's move forward 7,000 years. And we are to the Homeric legends, which were written down by Homer 3,000 years ago. Interestingly enough, when the, uh, when the Kalevala was written down, it froze in place. Kalevala is a 10,000-year-old set of myths. The Homeric myths are 3,000 years old. But let's see how people were in the world 3,000 years ago in the time of Troy. This is from another book, Science and Culture, The Western Tradition. Uh, senior editor is John Burke. This is 1987 or 1989. The introduction is by Richard Olson, Greek Science and Society. So I'm just going to read about a page. For example, Homer, sometime around the 8th century BC, explained the lightning that destroyed Odysseus's ship by fashioning a story in which the sun god Helios, Hypernion, enraged by the unauthorized slaughter of his sacred cows by Odysseus's men, 
demanded that Zeus punish them. Homer clearly shows that this was their particular act that provided divine retribution in the form of thunder and lightning aimed specifically at them. So as Odysseus recalled what happens, Lampatia of the light robes, daughter of the sun god and keeper of the flocks, ran swift with a message to Hyperion, the sun god, that we had killed his cattle. And angered at the heart, he spoke forth among the immortals, Father Zeus, you and other everlasting and blessed gods, punish the companions of Odysseus, son of Laertes, for they outrageously killed my cattle, in whom I always delighted on my way up into the starry heavens, or when I turned back again from the heavens towards earth. Unless these are made to give me just recompense for my cattle, I will go down to Hades and give my light to the dead men. Then, in turn, Zeus, who gathers the clouds, answered him, Helios, shine on, as you always do among the immortals and mortal men, all over the grain-giving earth. For my part, I will strike these men's fast ship midway on the open wine-blue sea in a shining bolt and dash it to pieces. Six days thereafter, my own eager companions feasted on the cattle of Helios, the sun god, cutting the best ones out. But when Zeus, the son of Kronos, established the seventh day, then at last the winds ceased from the stormy blowing, and presently we went aboard and put forth on the wide sea, and set the mast upright, and hoisted the white sail on it. But after we had left the land, and there were no more land in sight, but only the sea and the sky, then Cronian Zeus drew on a blue-black cloud and settled it over the hollow ship. And the open sea was darkened beneath it, and she ran on, but not for a very long time, as suddenly a screaming west wind came upon us, stormily blowing, and the blast of the storm winds snapped both forestays that were holding the mast, and the mast went over backwards, and all the running gear collapsed in a wash, and the man in the stern of the ship, the mast pole crashed down upon his head and pounded it to pieces, all the bones of his head, so that he, like a diver, dropped from the high deck, and the proud life left his bones there. Zeus with thunder and lightning together crashed our vessel, and struck by a thunderbolt of Zeus, she spun in a circle, and all was full of brimstone. My men were thrown in the water, bobbing like sea cows. They were washed away on the running waves all around the black ship, and the gods took away their homecoming. Well, it's wonderful. What is it? Homer has made up a story in which there are gods, there are people, there's cattle, there's grain-giving earth, there are ships on the wine-blue sea, and it's a personal interaction. Odysseus's men stole the cattle of Hyperion, and of course the god was angry, and the gods took revenge. So there's a story of personal accountability, responsibilities to the gods, responsibilities to one another, responsibilities to the earth. Please feel the situatedness of the story. These are people in their worlds with their gods doing their thing, responsibly or not, being punished or not, and answering to the gods in a totally situated way. This is not different than the god of the pond, the god of the rock, the god of the tree, the animistic traditions. Uh, not far away, uh, about a thousand years before, uh, my ancestors, the Hebrews, uh, Judaism, conveyed the idea of a single god. And it, it's, it's the god of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And one of the amazing things about the Jewish god is Moses talked to him. Moses argued with God. 
A God is somebody you can pray to, uh, you can talk to, you can argue with, you can reckon with. It's a personal relationship. It's another form of Luber's I-thou relationship with God. And who is responsible? Well, the gods are responsible and men are responsible. The world is totally meaningful. It's embodied, responsible, agentival action. About 800 years uh, after Thebes and Homer, maybe 500 years, in the Ionia, the first glimpse of science was born with famous tales, or Thales, uh, in, in Ionia. And he was the first to begin to seek, at least in the Western world, a natural explanation for what was going on. What, what Thales said was, it's not the gods. Everything is water. Reality is all made of water. It's the ore stuff from which things come. Well, think of what that did. You can pray to gods. Water is in its own way inert. It's just stuff in its own way dead. You cannot pray to water. Shortly thereafter, we got earth, air, fire, and water, Anaximanders and others. Shortly after that, Democritus with uncuttable things, atoms, moving in the void. We are beginning to develop an image of the starry heavens as a home of law because of the orderly behavior of the stars and, and the great Greek scientists like Archimedes and so on. And now we come forward a number of centuries and uh, uh, millennia, the church comes. Watch the changing views of the world. So in the Greek and the Hellenistic world, it becomes in part a world of law. And myth is present but not as strong. Eros, who we think of as the god of love, for the early Greeks was the god of chaos from whom everything sprang forth. It was the chaos of creativity. But there was also order, logos, in the orderly movement of the heavens and in the pre-Socratic philosophers getting us to Plato and Aristotle. So we will move towards everything is logos, all is law by the time we get to Newton, but we have to pass through the Christian era and being in the world in a different way. Already it is splitting apart with Thales. It's no longer just personal stories. So we then know that we have the Roman Empire and the collapse of the Roman Empire and the birth of Christianity. Think again what it was like to be in the world as a Christian in maybe 600 uh, AD in the south of France. So the Roman Empire has collapsed. Catholicism is now with St. Augustine the way we are in the world. We are in the world with God. God is omniscient, omnipotent, all-loving. Uh, and our purpose on earth is not so much this life, it's the next life and saving our souls so that may, we may arrive in heaven and avoid hell. At about that time, uh, a little before, after all, Ptolemy had uh, invented the Ptolemaic systems of astronomy, which did very, very well. And it had, uh, from Aristotle, the idea that, that stars move on perfect circles because circles are the most perfect form. So Aristotle conceives of the cosmos as concentric spheres that are spherical with the stars on them and the sun on them and the moon on them, all circling around the earth. With Christianity, there's not only the concentric spheres, the starry heavens, but God above, very far above, then angels, then man, woman, man, on earth. Below man are the animals, deer, worms, wiggly things, little things, even further down into the center of the earth uh, are the, the concentric spheres of hell in Dante's Divine Comedy. So by the middle of the first millennium and later than that, the cosmology of the West and how we were in the world was completely known. Ptolemy told us what worked and when we would get weird things like eclipses and it worked and that was reality. Now picture the church at the time that we get to, of course, Copernicus. So what did Copernicus do? Well, we know what he did. He said, just maybe the earth goes around the sun. Actually, a Greek had said that 2,000 years earlier. Copernicus published his work after he died. He knew what he was doing. 
he was changing yet again our knowledge of what reality is. For the church, the entire cosmology, the entire social structure, the entire moral structure of Christianity and Christendom was this view of uh, concentric spheres, God on the outside, man in the middle. Everything rotates around man. Everything is focused on man. If Copernicus was right, the church knew they would have to throw it out. Well, we then know that Galileo... Galileo had the temerity to look through his telescope and see four moons rotating around Jupiter. And he said, well, if the moons can rotate around Jupiter, why can't the Earth rotate around the Sun? Galileo is the one who brings forth the notion that the world is mathematical. So I will go back. Pythagoras said the same thing 2,500 years ago. The world is mathematics. And one of the strands running through our being in the world is the world is all mathematics. We will see that in, in Pythagoras. We will see it in Galileo who says the, the laws of nature of God are written in mathematics. And we will see the same thing in modern physics. That I'm going to tell you that is wrong, <laughs> which is a little startling. Uh, marvelous, but wrong. So anyway, we know that famously uh, Galileo was tried by the Inquisition. Here's this very interesting and intelligent couple of people, in particular Galileo, coming along and saying, you're wrong to the Pope and to the Catholic Church. Uh, we go around the sun. E por se muove, says Galileo, and still it moves. The Church knew it was going to be catastrophic to its worldview. Talk about politically incorrect. It couldn't have been more politically incorrect, and it shattered the way we were in the world in the West and started Western science. Which brings us to amazing Newton. He invented a whole way of thinking. It's just amazing mind. It's, it's, rather, uh, it's rather wonderful to know the following. Uh, Newton at age 20 didn't know any mathematics. And he, he was pretty interested in astrology. Astrology was a very interesting thing in those days. It was a study of the stars and what one could learn about nature by studying the stars. Alchemy was a big issue in those days. So, uh, so Newton uh, in Lancashire, or wherever he was because of their plague at the time, went into a, uh, a bookstore that had something on astrology, and he bought the book, and it had a figure in it that he couldn't understand. It was a complicated triangle, and he couldn't understand that, so he went and he bought a book on trigonometry, and he couldn't understand that either, so he bought Euclid's uh, Elements of Geometry from 2,000 years ago, and Newton could understand Euclid. Two years later, he invented the differential of the integral calculus and classical physics, and he was 23. This was a very smart person, probably the best scientist that we've ever known. So here's what Newton does, and I'm going to tell it to you in a way you may not have heard it. You know there's the three laws of motion that, that Newton has. Uh, a body continues in linear motion unless disturbed by an outside force. That's inertia. The Greeks actually knew about inertia, but we forgot. Second, if you do work on a hockey puck, you can accelerate it. So force is equal to the mass of something times its acceleration. <coughs> now think of the billiard table. So we all know a billiard table. And you know that a billiard table has the boundaries of the table, which are called the boundary conditions. The boundary conditions do something extremely interesting, and I need to tell it to you. If you tell me the boundary conditions of the table, I know all possible positions and velocities of the balls on the table. Well, the velocity of a ball times its mass is called its momentum. So if I define the boundary conditions of the table, I know all possible combinations of position and momenta. The set of all possible positions and momenta of the balls on the table is called the phase space of the system. It is, in fact, the space of the possibilities of the system. And then Newton says, uh, please note down the initial positions and momenta of the balls, so I know the initial conditions. And the Newton says, look, you want to know what's going to happen with the balls? Take my equations in differential form and integrate them. Well, to integrate Newton's laws uh, is to derive the logical consequences of the differential equations for the pathway of the balls in the phase space of the system. So Newton gives us a way of thinking. Define 
the phase space, define the essential variables here, position and momentum, uh, write down the equations of motion of the system in differential form, and integrate, and you will get the entailed becoming of, of the balls on the table. Let's call that the Newtonian paradigm. Newton's laws are time reversible also. So about a century after Newton, is something called the birth of reductionism. Simon Pierre Laplace, uh, at the time of Napoleon, argued as follows. If there were a demon in the sky, he called it a giant thinking machine, that could know the positions and the momenta of all the particles in the universe, that calculating engine, the demon, could work out the entire future of the universe, and in fact the entire past of the universe. That is Pythagoras 2,000 years later. It is the dream that the world is mathematical, totally mathematical in structure, and it is the birth of modern reductionism, which is if we know the, the mathematical theory and uh, we know something like the initial and the boundary condition, we can work out everything that will ever arise in the universe forever. And that is still the dominant view among physicists. So let's get to the next things that happened to the physicists. And you probably have all heard of quantum mechanics. So physics in, in, for Newton is entirely deterministic. Uh, and uh, it's causal. Uh, and Einstein and his general relativity is the culmination of classical physics. Around 1900, a man named Planck found a big hole in classical physics. Uh, and I won't go into the details of it, but one way of saying this is the following. People knew about radioactivity. And you know, if you put radioactive substance in the Geiger counter, it's going clicking. What the physicists worked out is that the clicks just occurred at completely random times, suggesting that there was no deterministic cause. For that and a variety of other reasons, uh, quantum mechanics demands that we give up determinism. So Newton is deterministic, and quantum mechanics comes along and says, well, no, uh, things just happen. They happen according to some rules. And a man named Schrodinger wrote down a thing, uh, an equation, that, that is a Schrodinger wave equation. So it's an equation about things like water waves propagating in the open ocean, except nobody knows what's propagating. It's just this mathematical thing that's propagating. Uh, there's arguments about what's propagating, but it's a wave equation, again, like water waves. And the, the Schrodinger equation propagates completely deterministically, exactly like Newton. But what propagates is not the trajectory of a particle, it's something very, very odd. It is the probability that if a quantum measurement takes place, uh, something will come to exist. Not that it had existed before, it will come to exist. So for example, it is the probability that an electron will come to exist at some, some time in space and space. That's the heart of quantum mechanics. So our current Myth is Big Bang, uh, quantum mechanics and general relativity. Nobody knows how to tie them together. And that is our current view of, of the shape of physics. And meanwhile, somehow life emerged and life has evolved, and we know Darwin, and the hominid lineage emerged along with the, uh, the mammals. But we went, we went, as we all know, for two billion years with single-celled organisms from the prokaryotes uh, and the archaea, bacteria and archaea, two vast families of life, to uh, the eukaryotic cell, which is due to the symbiosis of two bacteria, one of which became a chloroplast and the other the cell, and another became the mitochondria inside of cells, to the advent of multicelled organisms about 700 million years ago, to the staggering Cambrian explosion 550 million years ago, where all of a sudden there's all these wildly strange multi-cell, rather large animal things. It's in the Burgess Shale in the, uh, uh, in the uh, Canadian Rockies. So life blossomed, blossomed into this myriad set of organisms making their ways with one another. And out of the Burgess Shale, we get all of the major phyla today. We get spiders and we get uh, sea urchins and and the cephalopods like squid and an octopus, 
and we get uh, the, the fish, then the amphibians, and the reptiles, and T-Rex, then the mammalian lineage, and finally the hominid lineage emerging around the three million years ago uh, with Australopithecus, and then Australopithecus becomes Homo habilis, then Homo erectus, then Neanderthal and us, and that's our story now. So I think this is a good time to pause just to summarize. This is our creation myth. 10,000 years ago was the berry that becomes all that is. For Homer, uh, it's the gods and the creation of everything through Kronos uh, because uh, Zeus and his, his, his fellow uh, gods created the, be, defeated the Titans who were before them. In Genesis, it's God whose face moves upon the waters of the earth and separates day and night and heaven and earth and brings forth life that, that comes to be. Carry with us now, as we close this bit of session, that for all of these years, we have had a personal relationship with something responsible. The, the seed, uh, the gods, and if we steal cattle, we get into trouble. The Hebraic God, who is responsible, he is the creator of all the mystery around us, it didn't create itself. The intelligence are are in the skies. The intelligence is even above the outer spheres of the stars and comes down to us. Uh, an image that's lovely is uh, the magicians, the magi of the 16th and 15th and 14th century knew that if they rubbed rocks together the right way, they would pull down the virtues from the intelligence, uh, the, the intelligences that were even above uh, the, the starry night. Well, that's the same thing as praying. You're, you're doing the Kabbalah and you are bringing down the virtues of the heavens or the gods. Uh, so we came a long way. And now we still have religion with us. A final thing that I will say, um, with Thales, water became a substance, but it was meaningless. It's just water. 20 years ago or 30 years ago, Nobel Prize winning physicist Steven Weinberg said, the more we know of the universe, the more meaningless it appears. The man's brilliant. Fifty years ago, we had existentialism saying the same thing. The more we know of the universe, the more meaningless it appears. It's not. Let's see where we've come. We listened to Kalevala from 10,000 years ago when the berry left by Kalervo's, Kulervo's knife becomes all that is. And I feel awestruck. I don't know if you do. Then 7,000 years later, uh, we hear of why it is that Odysseus' ship is sunk mid-sea. And it's because Odysseus's men have stolen the cows of Helios, the god of the sun, who goes to Zeus and begs Goose, Zeus to please destroy Odysseus' a ship, uh, which happens when a thunderbolt comes down from a cloud that Zeus lets loose. And there's a completely personal action. And then we talked about uh, the Jewish god, God, uh, about the same time. And Moses argued with God. So we could talk in a personal relationship with the gods. But at the same time as, or 300 years later, around 500 BC or 700 BC, Thales or Thales in Ionia began to say, no, this is not the action of a personal god or a god up there. This is just water. It's the natural behavior of the world. And then water became earth, air, fire, and water became Democritus, atoms, and the void. Uh, became Pythagoras and all his mathematics. Uh, you can't pray to water. It's not personal, it's a substance. Water was to Thales what, what quarks and gluons are to us today. And that becomes, uh, that becomes Newton and Newton's laws, which I'm going to go over again, which stand over against the church's interpretation of cosmology. You cannot pray to the mathematical equations. You can't apply, you can't pray. It's no longer a personal relationship. I want to get back to, again, Newton. He's going to be central to us. 
So, you know, he has the three laws of motion. Inertia, things continue in a straight line unless disturbed by an outside force. Uh, uh, force is equal to mass times acceleration. F is equal to ma, his second law. His third law is for every action an equal and opposite reaction. And that got us to the billiard table and the boundaries of the billiard table, which you will recall got us to the space of all possible positions and momentum of the balls on the table, which is the phase space of all the possibilities. Then we have, and this is so fundamental, Newton's law in differential equation forms, which he invented, uh, which says the rate of change of one thing may depend upon itself or some other things. So the rate of change of it right now depends upon some other things right now. And then you follow that through time to see what happens. To follow it through time is to integrate uh, Newton's differential equations, and you get the flow of the billiard balls on the table for all time, uh, forward, and Newton's laws are time reversible, so backward. It's terribly important that I convey to you that when you integrate Newton's equations, you're carrying out a deduction. You're deducing the consequences for the motions of the balls over some long period of time of the differential equations. So here's, here's, here's deduction. The Greeks invented it. All men are mortal. Socrates uh, is a man. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. So that's deduction. And Aristotle said that the central means of explanation in science is a deduction. And in effect, that's exactly what Newton did. Then he also, of course, has universal gravitation. So with his three laws of motion and universal gravitation, Newton founds make one mind. One mind founds everything that becomes classical physics. He even worked on optics, thought, thought that, that light rays were in fact little corpuscles. About the same time, somebody thought they were waves, and that carries forward into the future. So let me call the Newtonian paradigm a statement of the relevant variables of a system. Relevant is important. For the particles or the billiard balls, it's their position and momentum. It's not the color of the balls, and it's not the number three painted on a ball. It's the position and momentum. So you need to know the relevant variables somehow. And then you write down what are called the laws of motion of the system. In Newton's case, it's his three laws of motion. Then you create the phase space of the system by the boundary conditions. And then you integrate the equations to get an entailed, logically entailed trajectory, in this case of the balls on the table. But of course, as I told you, 100 years later, uh, Saint-Empire Laplace at the time of Napoleon realized that if there were a demon in the sky who knew the positions and the momenta of all the particles in the universe, he could integrate Newton's equations and know from the entailed trajectories the entire future and the entire past of the universe. That's the birth of modern reductionism. This is Pythagoras writ large. This is Galileo saying the world is written in mathematics. I mean, it is the Newtonian paradigm. And the conclusion from that, that there's some set of laws somewhere that entail everything that will ever happen in the universe. That's reductionism. Then came along quantum mechanics and brilliant Steven Weinberg 20 years ago saying, the more we know of the universe, the less meaningful it seems. And I said he was wrong. Well, he's right and wrong. We'll get later to why he's wrong. But the basic answer is the living world is rife with meaning as we make our livings with one another, and that's not in the physics. We'll come back to that. First, I want to ask, say, what has happened to modern reductionism? It held sway uncriticized until about 1972, when Nobel laureate Philip Anderson wrote a paper in science. It's either 72 or 77. And Anderson said, more is different. And what he is going to say is that uh, down at the bottom, there's uh, the quarks and the gluons and the particles and quantum mechanics. But at higher levels, new, new phenomena arise that have their own laws at that level, and you cannot deduce the laws at the higher level from the laws at the lower level. So I'm going to give you some examples. 
Phil's example, we were quite close friends. I, I truly love Phil Anderson. One of Phil's examples is a pole standing upright on the a table that has the rotational symmetry of the plane. If it falls over, for which there's no explanation, it picks a direction. So that's a symmetry breaking. And then new things happen. Another Nobel, and I'm going to give you one other example in a moment, Nobel laureate Robert Lochlin, uh, both solid state physicists, uh, wrote a book saying for the universe from the bottom down. So in the late 20th century, Nobel Prize winning physicists started to say, there's something wrong with reductionism. New phenomena arise at a higher level. There are laws at the higher level, uh, but they cannot be deduced from the lower level. A famous example is the Navier-Stokes equation. It's the equation for incompressible fluids, namely water flow. It works perfectly well. Apparently, nobody can deduce it from the underlying quantum mechanics. So here are the first hints saying there really isn't a law down there that entails everything. It doesn't even entail fluid flow. I'm going to tell you something much worse, but it will take a while, or much better. For the evolution of the biosphere, it's not that there are new law-like behaviors that occur at the level of an evolving biosphere. It's going to turn out that there's no laws at all, there are, in the sense of no entailing laws in the Newtonian sense. The evolution of a biosphere is based on physics fundamentally, but it's becoming is totally beyond the Newtonian paradigm, in effect for the first time in 330 years. This is a very big claim, and I'm, I'm quite sure I'm right, but of course I may be wrong. So let's examine the reasons, and if I'm right, uh, I hope that the physicists will look at it. It's enormously liberating. Uh, it doesn't stop physics where physics by itself works, which is essentially everything in physics and chemistry and geology. But before I get there, let's pause and look how superb physics is today. So there's general relativity, which you know about, and there's the fundamental theory in quantum mechanics that unites the, uh, the uh, uh, electromagnetic force, the weak force, and the strong force, and it's called the standard model of particle physics. Both theories have been confirmed to 13 decimal places. So what's 13 decimal places? Well, a million is six decimal places, a trillion is 12 decimal places, so it has been confirmed to one in 10 trillion. That's enormously spectacular success, and it's all mathematics. I'm going to criticize the world being all mathematical towards the end. I'm less sure of that than my earlier claim about no entailing law, but it is spectacular. A famous physicist whose name has slipped me right now said, the unreasonable usefulness of mathematics in physics. He's right. I'm going to come to talk about something with some tongue in cheek about the reasonable uselessness of mathematics for the evolution of a biosphere. At least the kind of mathematics we know now. Be careful, I may be entirely wrong. The next thing I have to explain to us is the fundamentals of statistical mechanics. Uh, I, because I need to get to a notion called ergodic, and then from that I need to get to a notion called non-ergodic. So bear with me if you're not a physicist. Let's give a simple example. Suppose you take a coffee cup, and it's filled with black coffee, and you put a little bit of milk in the coffee cup, and you don't stir it. Well, the little drop sits there for a while, and then it kind of swirls away. Uh, and if you wiggle the cup a little bit, it swirls, and you can see the patterns of the milk uh, distributing itself into the, into the coffee. And after a while, it becomes uh, something like a dark tan, and the color stops changing. The color stopping changing is, in fact, what the physicists mean when they talk about equilibrium. So let me talk about it in a little more detail now. So we're, we want to consider uh, a liter box of, of gas. So a liter is about a quart. It's, I think it's 10 centimeters on a side. And it's filled with a very large number of gas particles. So Boltzmann in the 1870s or 1880s, Ludwig Boltzmann, was trying to think, how can I possibly describe the behavior of these gas molecules? Well, think of the billiard balls. For any billiard ball, you could describe its position with three numbers, up, down, left, right, back, forth. 
and you can describe its movement, it's going in some direction, so you can describe its velocity and therefore the mass times the velocity with, th with three numbers. You can describe the, the, the amount that it's moved times its mass in the three spatial axes, right? So six numbers tell you the position and the momentum of that one little particle or ball. So if you've got two particles, you can describe their, their positions and momentum together with 12 numbers. If you have n particles, or n is a huge number, 6n numbers will allow you to describe the current position and the current momenta of all of the particles bouncing around inside the box. Uh, instead of thinking about a three-dimensional space like a box, uh, think, and you can't picture it, but think about a 6n dimensional space. And n is a huge number, so 6n is huge. But every point in that space, it's less mysterious than you think, every point in that space gives the values of the positions and the momenta of all of the n particles at the same instant. So it says for particle one, you're here and you're moving that way, but that one particle two, it does the same thing. So it's describing the instantaneous positions and the momenta of n particles. Well, all the positions and momenta of the n particles, just like the billiard balls, are confined to being inside the box. So there's a phase space for all the possible positions and momenta of the particles in the box. So Roughly, here's what uh, Boltzmann thought. Suppose all the particles were crowded into the lower left corner of the box. Well, if you leave them alone, they'll bounce around, and then after a while, they'll be all over the box, more or less randomly, right? What Boltzmann came up with, and I'll give you the sense of it, is a mathematical formula for the tendency of the particles in the box uh, to distribute themselves more or less uniformly just like the milk does in your coffee cup. And there is a measure of that called the entropy of the system. And the entropy of the system is a measure of how disordered the positions of the particles are. It's a little fancier than that, and I can actually tell you precisely. Take our six n dimensional box in our mind's eye and break it up into a lot of, a lot of little six n dimensional boxes that fill the whole box, six n dimensional, like ice cubes in a, in a box. So there's lots and lots and lots of these little boxes, and they're called microstates, because that's what the physicists want to call them. And now Boltzmann said, let's define a macrostate. Well, a macrostate turns out to be any two or more microstates. So you can pick any two microstates or 10 microstates or 10 billion microstates you want. Uh, and then he defines the entropy of a macrostate. So here's the idea. If a macrostate has a, 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 a thousand little boxes in it, then the entropy of that box is the logarithm of the number of microstates. So it's to the base 10, the logarithm is three. If it's to the base E, it's whatever, it's seven or eight. Then he does something amazing. So let's think about the number of ways of arranging the particles so they're in the lower left corner of the, of the box. Well, there's not very many compared to the question of how many ways are there of arranging the particles so they're more or less uniformly distributed all over the box? And the answer is there's vastly many more ways of the latter. So let's define two macrostates. The macrostate with them all in the lower left corner and the vastly larger macrostate with them all more or less uniformly distributed. Now let's take the logarithm of the numbers of those states it's much smaller for the ones in the lower left-hand corner than all over the box. Uh, so uh, the entropy of the state when they're all in the lower left corner is much lower than the entropy of the state uh, when the, when the system, a macro state when they're all over the box. He does one more absolutely amazing step that caused him grief with his colleagues. We've got a very large number of Newtonian particles bouncing around in the box. And, and Boltzmann says, you know, I don't have a hope of integrating Newton's equations. Well, I'm going to make a guess, and it's called the ergodic hypothesis. And here it is, that if you look at the system over a long time, it will spend equal times in equal volumes of this phase space. He's not integrating the equations of motion of Newton. He's just saying it'll spend equal time and equal volumes. 
That's the ergodic hypothesis. Given it, it follows that the system will tend to spend a lot more time in a macro state with lots of micro states than it will spend in, in time in a system, uh, in the state of the system that has a small number of states, namely a tiny macro state. And that then leads to the second law of thermodynamics. The system will tend to flow, not deterministically, because he's given up integrating the equations, from states of low entropy to states of high entropy. That's the second law. And equilibrium is arriving at that macro state that is most uniformly distributed inside the box. That does not mean that the particles aren't moving around. Equilibrium means that macroscopic features such as temperature, the average kinetic energy of the particles, and the average pressure against the walls of the box as particles bounce off of it, stops changing. So equilibrium uh, here is constant temperature and constant pressure, more or less like the coffee being uh, a uniformed, uh, slightly tan brown. So that's the concept and the central concepts of statistical mechanics. So next point is the following. The laws of physics are reversible for, for Newton and, and in quantum mechanics. Time seems to flow in one direction. Why? Well, the standard answer in physics is, uh, in this, this is the second law of thermodynamics, is that entropy in a closed system, it's a closed box, always tends to increase. And that's the direction of time. Eggs break, they don't reassemble themselves. So the second law is fundamental. Or now let me say what non-ergodic is. Uh, non-ergodic is that the system hasn't got, not ergodic, means for the physicist that it hasn't gotten to equilibrium yet. So when you put the drop of milk in the coffee cup and you just stir it a little bit or wiggle it a little bit, there's a while when you can see the white and brown uh, regions swirling around. It's not uniform. So it is not ergodic or non-ergodic. In the case of the coffee cup, it's on its way to equilibrium. So hold that. And in fact, it'll get to equilibrium in, in, in an hour. So now I want to get to a cosmological problem. The only arrow of time is the second law. We need to know the fundamental particles in physics. So you know there's quarks. Uh, there's three families of quarks, and they come in basically uh, three colors or flavors each, and they can convert to one to another. And they're bound together by exchanging gluons, which are particles of energy. Then there's electrons and photons and there's intermediate particles that I'm not going to talk about, and you should know there's matter and antimatter. Uh, so here's the puzzle. I'm more or less quoting uh, Carlo Rovelli, a very, very able physicist, who says, the beginning of the universe, it was a hot cork gluon soup. It was at 10 to the 15th degrees Kelvin, uh, which is whatever it is Fahrenheit. It's incredibly hot. Well, it was already at equilibrium. It was just like the particles in the, in the closed box and it's already got, quotes, maximum equilibrium. But, but we want to say that time is associated with an increase in entropy. But it's already got maximum entropy. How can entropy increase? It's already got maximum entropy. Carlo thinks, and Lee Smolin thinks, and I understand them, and I think, I think Carlo's found the answer. Uh, and it's lovely. And it's so much fun because you look at it and you say, oh, I could have thought of that but you probably couldn't have. So here it is. Let's go back to the leader box, uh, and it's got the gas particles in it, and they're all over the box. Now I want magically, I want to imagine that magically, the leader box can get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. It gets to be the size of a, you know, two feet across, then 14 feet in each direction, and then it's just getting bigger. Well, as it gets bigger, the, suppose that the particles in the box don't move, and it gets bigger very rapidly, then the particles find themselves in a small region of the now expanded box, right? Well, that's Carlo's idea. If the phase space of the universe increases, then there's more possibilities for the particles to move into, so the second law can hold, and disorder can continue to increase, so there are one-way processes and that can be the answer. So Carlo suggests it. Well, 
Now I want to quote my friends Lee Smolin and, and Marina and, and Andrew Little. Um, so when the universe starts, it's so hot that the only things around that are stable are quarks and gluons and electrons and photons and their and neutrinos and their antiparticles. As the universe expands because of the Big Bang, it gets cooler. When it gets cooler at some point, uh, three quarks can bind together and they can make a proton or they can make a neutron. Well, bound things together are what the physicists call bound states. So I'm going to use their language. They, that's all they mean. So Smolin's way of saying it with his colleagues and me hanging on is when the universe cools enough, new possibilities open up. Now the universe can make protons and neutrons and electrons and antiprotons and antineutrons. Then the universe cools a little bit more. Uh, and now for the first time, the universe can make atoms like, uh, like hydrogen and helium. And in stars, it can make all 98 stable atoms. So again, the phase space of the universe expands and the universe goes ahead and it makes these in stars. So this is really a combination of Carlo and Lee Smolin and Marina Cortez and Andrew Little speaking. It's going to have to do with the fact that what's going on in the universe is not only that uh, there's a breaking of symmetry in gravitation and we get, we get galaxies and stars and planets because gravitation is an attractive force, but that the very phase space of the universe is increasing and it's doing so for two major reasons. One, the universe itself is expanding like a balloon. And it's, its expansion is accelerating due to whatever dark energy is and we've known that now for about 20 years. But the other part that we don't think about very much is 13.7 uh, billion years ago there were quarks and gluons, there weren't any atoms. Somewhat later the universe cooled and it could make protons and neutrons. It cooled a little bit more and inside of, inside of the surface. Now the universe could make all kinds of stable atoms, 98 of them. After that, the universe could make little molecules. So let's talk about molecules. The foundations of organic chemistry is carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur, chin-ups. We have 98 atoms, that's about six of them or seven. So by the time the universe gets old, it has all these kinds of atoms, it could start making molecules. You can bind one carbon to one nitrogen uh, you can bind one carbon to another carbon. You can make ever more complex molecules. So what happened in the universe starting maybe a hundred million years or uh, maybe a billion years after the universe was formed, it start making molecules. Well, we don't know too much about the time course of the making of molecules in the universe. We know for sure that at one point there weren't any molecules in the universe. And we know something stunning. When the solar system formed five billion years ago, uh, it left behind meteorites uh, that some landed. One is called the Murchison meteorite, and it landed in Murchison, Australia, I think in 1967, and people have looked at the kinds of molecules on it. It's got about 60,000 kinds of molecules. And there's a moon of Saturn called Enceladus, and it has spray coming up from its under ice oceans, they have 60 or 70,000 kinds of molecules. We know the universe all on its own hooked up 60, 70, 80,000 kinds of molecules roughly 5 billion years ago. Therefore, presumably everywhere in the universe there was that kind of chemical diversity. So the universe is making this spray of ever more kinds of things. We're introduced here to two notions that people don't talk about very much. What has happened with respect to the chemical evolution of the universe is it started without even any atoms, with only around 10 or 12 kinds of particles. Then it made some protons and neutrons and electrons and photons. Uh, then it was able to make 98 kinds of atoms, feel the increasing diversity. Then it started making molecules, and it can make ever more kinds of molecules. Is there any end to the kind of molecules that the universe can make? No. So. Uh, so I'm going to get now to a point that I've realized for a long time ago, and it's going to be fundamental. So 
uh, and the cork glue on soup, it's ergodic. There was a time when the universe had never made carbon. Then it made carbon. And it had never made uranium. Then it made uranium. So there's a long time scale on which the universe had not made, and during that time scale, on that time scale, for those things, it was not ergodic or non-ergodic. So I realized something funny a number of years ago, and I'm going to say it now. And it's that the universe is non-ergodic on amazingly long time scales. So let's think about it the following way. You know, proteins are made of 20 kinds of amino acids, uh, alanine, arginine, and so on. And they're strung together like 20 colored beads on a string. A typical protein in you has about 300 amino acids strung end to end. And there's 20 kinds. So let's ask, how many possible proteins are like 200 amino acids? Well, there's 20 possibilities at each position. So it's 20 times 20 times 20 times 20, 200 times. So it's 20 to the 200th. 20 to the 200th is 10 raised to the 260th power. This is a really big number. It's one with 260 zeros after it. Well, so what? I'm going to ask a funny question. Could the universe have made all of these possible proteins in the entire lifetime of the universe, which is 13.7 billion years, or about 10 to the 17 seconds? Well, I'm about to persuade you that the answer is no. So there's 10 to the 80th particles in the universe. The fastest time scale is the Planck time scale of 10 to the minus 43rd seconds. So if all of the 10 to the 80th particles were doing nothing but in parallel, making proteins length 200 every 10 to the minus 43rd seconds, it would take the age of the universe raised, multiplied by 10 to the 37th to make all possible proteins length 200 once. The universe will never make all these complicated things. And this means something absolutely fundamental. The universe really won't make all possible things that are complicated. So there's a level of complexity above which the universe is non-ergodic on time scales vastly longer than the lifetime of the universe. This is going to, so that says most complex things will never exist. But we exist. We exist, what's happening? So it, it turns out that the universe is probably made about all, all kinds of molecules up to around 500 Daltons. A Dalton is the weight of a hydrogen. So it's made a whole bunch of things. But above that, it hasn't made everything. I'm going to get to it in a moment. You have a heart. All humans have hearts, well, most of us. The heart's a really complicated thing. How did it manage to get to exist in a non-ergodic universe? Hang on to that. Because answering it is going to take us beyond Newton. Uh, but I now want to uh, come back to my friends Lee and uh, Marina and Andrew and I. So we, we are defining, Lee is smart enough, three time scales a kind of short time scale of a couple centuries of the length of time a system can be non-ergodic and come to equilibrium. The second time scale is the life of the universe, call this type two uh, non-ergodic, and there are things that come to equilibrium but only roughly within the lifetime of the universe. For example, the lifetime of stars. I'm learning all of this from them. We are calling type three non-ergodic things that cannot come to equilibrium in vastly longer than the lifetime of the universe. So, in fact, they will never come to equilibrium. We will never make all possible complex things.